Did you get First Corinthians five? First Corinthians five and Matthew twenty eight. Hey, Ron. All right, make a note on your calendar that there will be no evening service April 30th. Okay, so April 30th is a Sunday. There will be no afternoon service this service will not happen on april 30th most of us are going to be over at another church's meeting over in missoula so quite a few people going if you're interested in that please ask me or my wife about it I'll get you the details also there will be no wednesday service may 3rd so april 30th may 3rd won't be anybody here okay there's still snacks in the back please eat those somebody so i don't have to eat them all and all the kids left like half-eaten cookies, but I did my duty, got them all taken care of. But um, <laughs> if you can take a cookie, eat the whole thing so I don't have to. Okay, and then we have street preaching uh, next Saturday the 15th. Saturday the 15th, and then is Faith in here? Okay, Faith, come here. Come on down. This certifies that, uh, why are you laughing? This certifies that Faith Coates completed the basic Bible ship doctrine discipleship course like a long time ago. But I finally remembered what the same time that they're here. All right, so there's your test and your certificate for the Luke. Luke Coates completed the basic Bible doctrine discipleship course, including 40 hours of instruction on the biblical doctrines of salvation, eternal security, Bible study, prayer, sin, and the two natures of the believer. And Sarah, continuing, on this first day of March 2023, is and is able, this is everybody, to disciple others in these Bible doctrines. So you got the Bible, sh Bible discipleship course, and you are able to disciple others. So who said that? I'm saying that. That's why I gave you a certificate. Okay. So a number of you got those already. A number of you took the course and are familiar with it. I'm a little behind, but I do get caught up on my paperwork eventually. Okay, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5. How many of you had the holiday of Good Friday this year affect you somehow? Somehow, you either had time off work, couldn't trade your stock portfolio on the NASDAQ, or something in between, all right? So it's a holiday, it's a thing, it's a real thing. And the teaching is that Jesus Christ uh, was crucified on Friday and that he was in the grave until the third day. I'm not going to show all this stuff, but this is just if I get stuck here. He was crucified on the third day, uh, and, or crucified and rose again on the third day. Mark 15.31, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Mark 8.31, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Uh, Matthew 12, verse 40. This one you should probably memorize or be able to find it. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so also must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, so three days and three nights. Um, what else? Luke 24, 7, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And besides all this, verse 21, today is the third day since these things were done. Uh, Luke 24, 46, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and be killed and rise again, and be raised again the third day, Matthew 16, 21. So it's pretty clear in Scripture that there's three days that elapsed between Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. So in red here, Let's count this here as uh, a time on this chart and see if we can count to three. How many of you think you can count to three? I don't think you can, not from Friday to Sunday, but maybe you know some math I didn't learn in school. Okay. Now, this is nighttime here. 
and it continues till here, but, but to avoid confusion, I won't draw those all the way through. So this is the evening. We can call this 6 p.m. and just note that if I say 6 a.m. or 6 p.m., I mean sunrise or sunset. Okay, I don't mean the literal on the Timex 6 p.m., um, but for just ease of teaching, I'm going to call this 6 p.m. here, and that's evening. And Jesus was crucified sometime after 3 p.m. and before 6 p.m. I'll show you those references and why that is in a moment. Okay. And the teaching is that Jesus Christ was crucified on Friday, and that makes it Good Friday. Now, can I just say something here for a second? Isn't this Good Sunday, and this should be Bad Friday? I don't know. I, I mean, if you're saved, it's good for you, right? But the greatest day on God's calendar in eternity is not this day that Jesus Christ was crucified. That solved the problem of sin that was created by man because of a curse, because Adam, a couple weeks before, a couple thousand weeks before, Adam messed everything up, right? And if Adam hadn't messed everything up, we would have never needed this day. We could have all been eaten off the tree of life, wouldn't even had to go home for Easter lunch. We could have just ate apples and oranges and whatever else we ate, unless the apple was the cursed tree, and then we wouldn't want to eat that. But anyhow, Jesus was crucified somewhere here, Okay. And I'm going to let you count that as a day, even though that's not a day. That's not a day. That's an hour or maybe two hours, less than three hours. So let's go day, night, day, night, day, night. Okay? So that's three of those and three of those. Is that three days and three nights? Okay, Friday day. I'm giving it to you. You don't, you don't deserve it, but I'm giving it to you. Okay? And then we have the night here, so that's going to be... Friday night, Saturday morning, you get one night. Okay, so let's check these off. Here's the day, here's the night. Now we got Saturday day, just reading the red here. Saturday day, giving you one there. And then you've got Saturday night. Now, I shouldn't give you this because Jesus was out of the tomb before the women got there in the morning. And I'll show you that verse in a minute. But I'm going to give you this night, okay? I'm going to give it to you even though... It's not in the Bible anywhere, but if you think that, that's fine. Okay, and then he was resurrected before they got there at the tomb at sunrise. So you don't get to count this as a day, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. Okay, one more night, one more day. How many days and nights is that? That's me stretching it as much as you can possibly stretch it, and it still doesn't add up to three days and three nights. Okay, does everybody see that? Now what that means is that somebody is holding their tradition above their scriptures. And Paul said, hold fast to the traditions which you're taught. He didn't, there's a little ringing in here. Paul said, hold fast to the traditions which you're taught. He didn't say, throw out every tradition ever. But tradition in the Bible is traditionally bad. Okay, most of them, most of them are in the negative sense about 13 times, if I remember right. And one of them or two of them are good. So you ought to hold fast to the traditions if they're good. You should hold fast to traditions that match Scripture, and then secondarily, that don't contradict Scripture. Is there anything that says that you ought to be wearing, uh, that you ought to dress up for Sunday and wear nicer clothes on Sunday than the rest of the week? Is there anything in the Bible that says that? Zero. There's zero. You say, why do you dress up? Because it's a tradition. That's all. You say, oh, I don't think I ought to. Then don't. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. You say, well, I think that uh, we should all wear a suit jacket that's a dark suit and a white shirt and a dark tie. Okay, well, you do that in your church, okay? And if I go to your church, I'll respect you, and if I know about that, I'll, I'll try to respect that. You say, I think we should wear ripped jeans and Hawaiian shirts. And our... I'm going to get dressed in the morning and pray about it, and I don't have any Hawaiian shirts, so I'm not sure how the Lord's going to answer that. But in that church... I'm not going to try to be a jerk and try to put some, you under something that the traditions that I've been taught were from a totally different background, okay? How much does that matter? I don't know. In eternity, how much does it matter to dress up nice on Sunday? Do you know there's no Sunday school in the New Testament? There's no Sunday school buildings, no Sunday school programs, no Sunday school superintendent. There's no office of the Sunday school leader. There, it isn't there. But why do we have Sunday school? 
Well, somebody back in the 1800s again thought that those kids and the orphan kids and the kids that had parents that didn't care about church ought to get some training and they ought to school them on Sunday since they're not getting any of the rest of the week. And so they gave them an education on Sunday and they also taught them through the Bible. What a terrible thing. You, I have a book in my office called Pagan Christianity where the guy says Sunday school isn't biblical and so we shouldn't have Sunday school. Separate the children from the main service. Okay, there's nothing in the Bible for or against that, but don't tell me Sunday school is pagan. How about that? Yeah. All right? Okay, let's just come to agreement somewhere. All right, so this isn't going to work. There's no three days and three nights in Good Friday. So some people like to move it to Thursday. So that's the blue here on this board. Now let's add another day to the week and see if we can get Thursday to work. So, wow, that's loud, sorry. So we'll get the uh, extra day here and we'll call this Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday. Jesus is crucified here. Let's keep it blue for simplicity. That's going to stay the same. And then uh, this time I'm going to try to be scriptural, right? Okay, I'm not going to give you all the extra days. Um, if you want to take them and you want to believe Thursday, then you can build a better case for it. And Thursday is way better than, when, than uh, Friday for sure. But this doesn't count as a full day, and I'll give you the verse. I should give you that verse sooner. How about uh, John chapter 11, verse 9? Somebody read John 11, verse 9 for me. Okay, now there's a lot of things when you start studying this that say, I'm um, talking about online or people I've spoken to about this, and they say there's nothing that says three days and three nights has to be 72 hours. Well, yeah, that phrase isn't in there. But Jesus told you what he calls a day. So the Bible has two references for day, Genesis 1-5 and the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay, so you can count a day as 24 hours. And then Jesus says, are there not yet 12 hours in the day? So a day of daylight is, is 12 hours, or a day and a night is 24 hours. Okay? So you get two hours here. You don't get a day. And that's two hours at a max. It may have been half an hour. Okay? Do you get a night here? Okay? Thursday to Friday, you get one night. Friday, you get one day. Friday to Saturday, you get one night. Now what happens? Well, now you got Saturday night to Sunday morning. Uh, let me start over so I don't confuse everything. One night, one day, got those. And then one night, one day, I wrote these backwards. And then one night here, Saturday night. But again, Jesus was risen before daylight on Sunday. So the only way you can count Sunday is if you ignore that the women were at the tomb at the rising of the sun. We'll look at the verse in a minute. And Jesus was already resurrected and you're going to count this day anyways as a day. So you don't get to count that day and you really don't get to count this as a full day. So now you've got two days and two nights. You know what I found humorous? This made me chuckle. I looked up Encyclopedia Britannica on Good Friday and they said Good Friday teaches that Jesus died on Friday, and two days later, he rose again on Sunday. And I was like, yep, there you go. <laughs> you guys got it right in spite of yourselves. The Catholic Encyclopedia. Okay, that's, that's Thursday. Counting properly, not trying to fudge anything. You still can't get to three days and three nights. So let's get rid of the blue here. Okay, and let me write these a little larger here, and I'm going to use this calendar in just a minute for the Old Testament. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, let's add our day back in here. And let's count one more time. Let's use green this time. I'm not going to count this day because. It's not a full day. 
I'm going to count. Let me write these in order this time. Night, day, night, day, night, day. Let's see if we can come up with enough here. One night, Wednesday, Thursday. One day, Thursday. One night, Thursday, Friday. One day, Friday. One night, Friday, Saturday. One day, Saturday. Say what happened there? Now we're too short. No, we're not too short. We are just perfect, and it's going to match Scripture perfect in every reference that you turn to. Okay? And then what happened to the women? Well, the women showed up here. Oh, we'll run those, run those references in a minute. Okay, now we got to back all the way up. Go to 1 Corinthians 5. Okay, so hopefully you see the problem. But now we create a new problem, and that is finding what the Scripture teaches is correct because you have it in your head wrong for so long, it's really hard to get it the other way. This year, um, Brother Curtis sent me an article the other day and showed Thursday was the day of the crucifixion, and I reworked everything for a couple hours, and I tried to force Thursday to fit, and I almost got it. Almost got it to fit, and it won't fit. And it's just going to have to be Wednesday. There's no way around it. And then it fits everything else once you, once you find it, that everything fits. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. You say, is this even that important to study? 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven that you may be a new lump. The old leaven. Leaven in the Bible pictures sin, and unleavened pictures not defiled by sin. Look at the rest of verse 7. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now, a New Testament Christian ought to be familiar with his Old Testament. I know that it's not as exciting as the New Testament because it's not all about you. I find that the internet heresies and the YouTube theologians of today and the problems that I come up with with people asking me questions in the Bible and questions in church and outside of church mainly stem from an ignorance in Old Testament studies. And I, I wouldn't have maybe figured this out on my own, but I watched a Q&A of a, of a president of a college, and it's a college I respect. It's actually, uh, they preach the King James Bible at this college. And he had a stack of cards, Q&A. Him and his wife were there on the platform, and they gave him these cards, and, and they, they read the card and then gave an answer, kind of off the cuff. And so he got through a few questions, and then one of the cards says, what do you regret the most in your ministry? And I'm, I'm like, I'm all ears here, because I'm 30 listening to this, and this guy's in his 50s. I said, I'm all ears. What does he regret the most in his ministry? And he said, the thing I regret most is, especially in my early ministry, I neglected my Old Testament studies. And I thought, oh, man, that's why every student I've met from your school is ignorant of the Old Testament. Anytime I try to tell them anything in the Bible, they blink at me like, oh, yeah, I know that. And they would have no idea what I'm talking about. And it's kind of embarrassing. And then you've got to sit there and teach them, but they don't want to be taught because they already went to Bible school, so they can't be taught. If you stop learning after you graduate from Bible school, woe unto you. Boy, I didn't even begin to learn until 10 years after I got out of Bible school. All right, take good notes and stuff them away. <laughs> Maybe you'll understand them later. Okay, is the Old Testament important? Well, Jesus Christ is our Passover. That's Old Testament. You are not supposed to be leavened. That's Old Testament. You are supposed to be unleavened. So turn to Exodus chapter 12. Turn to the boring old book. Who reads Exodus? You get through Genesis 30 and you're like, oh, hang it up, go to Romans. Look at Exodus, Exodus 12. And look at verse 1. Exodus 12, 1. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. What month is this? You got to go over to 13:4, maybe make a cross reference there. 13:4. And this day, Exodus 13:4, this day came ye out in the month Abib. Might want to make another cross reference if you're a Bible writer. Numbers 33:3. Numbers 33:3. Okay? That's going to be the 15th day in Numbers 33, but we're talking about the 14th day here. <clears throat> okay, Exodus 12, 
Exodus 12, verse 2, this month, that's Abib, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Okay, so they don't start their month in their year in January. Who in the world would start a calendar in January, I ask you? What's going on in January? <laughs> it's the darkest time of the year. It's 10 days removed from the winter solstice. It's about the most dreadful, miserable time. We're like, Happy New Year. There's nobody happy. Everybody maxed out their credit cards for Christmas, and it's pretty depressing. The better time to start a year would be this week. This would be a great time to start a year. Wouldn't it be a great time to start a year? How many think it would be a great time to start a year? The Lord thinks it's a great time to start a year. He says he started in Abib. Abib has to do with the time of year that the barley is about ready to be harvested. So it's not ready to be harvested yet, but that's, that's a little more in-depth on the calendar. Okay, verse 3. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Each house gets one lamb. And if the house will be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. So you can share this between two houses if you like. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. All right, so you got some big eaters in your house. You need a bigger lamb. No, that's not what it means. But if you got less people, you can have another house involved. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So it can be a sheep lamb or a goat lamb. Verse 6. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So this is in the month Abib, beginning of your year. Did you notice it said take a lamb in verse 3? Any old lamb. Make sure it's the lamb, though. Did you notice the lamb in verse 4? If the household be too little for the lamb. So it's not just any old lamb. It's the lamb. John the Baptist said, Behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. But you'd better make it your lamb. Look at verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Now, all that Hebrew and Greek stuff I was talking about this morning, you want to you know a little secret? It ain't in the Hebrew. It's not there. It just accidentally, coincidentally, somehow happened to land in the English, and you've got a lamb, but you need the lamb, and you'd better make him your lamb. And there's only one. And your lamb, if he's your lamb, is without blemish and without spot. And how long was his ministry? Anybody know? How long was Jesus' earthly ministry when he came to this earth? Three and a half years. He came to this earth. Looks like he came in in the fall when he was born, and then his ministry began around his birthday. You find that in the book of Luke, Luke chapter uh, 2. Luke chapter 2, I'm guessing now. It says he was about 30 years of age after his baptism. He begins his ministry. And then you find a Passover in the Bible. And then you find another Passover in the Bible. And then you find a feast in the Bible that we think is a Passover. And then you find Jesus Christ, our Passover. So, by faith, I take that third one to be the Passover. But, you know, I can't prove that he was here for three and a half years. I can't prove it absolutely. Except he stood in the temple and said, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And many people heard Elias in his day until he came to that widow's son. And when he raised the widow's son from the dead, his ministry was three and a half years. And you're like, are you trying to tell us something, Lord? You're trying to tell us that Elijah had a three and a half year ministry and you have a three and a half year ministry, but you won't let us prove it conclusively? I've heard theologians in seminaries teach that Jesus had a five or a six or a seven year ministry and some people say it was a two and a half year ministry because they can only find the three Passovers but I just take it by faith that it's a three and a half year ministry you say how do you find that well you saw when they took the lamb didn't you it says that you take the lamb on the tenth day of the month and then you keep it until the fourteenth day of the month you say, do you take that lamb in the evening on the tenth day of the month? If you do, then you count one day, two days, three days, and you kill it in the evening on the fourteenth. You say, well, that's too many days. That's uh, one, two, three, four days. 
But read the verse again. It didn't say you take the lamb in the evening of the tenth day. It says you take it in the tenth day. What time? Oh, any time will do. You just take it in the middle of the tenth day, and now you've got one, two, three days in the evening, and a half day, and you have that lamb being in your house. Whoops, three and a quarter. You have that lamb being in your household for three and a half days to picture the Lord's three and a half year ministry. And then you kill it in the evening on the 14th. You say, well, shouldn't that be the next day? I'm glad you asked. Turn to Leviticus 23. Turn to Leviticus 23. Hold your place in Exodus. Turn to Leviticus 23. None of this uh, frivolous statement making. I, I can't stand reading other people's articles and they say, the Jewish people consider any part of a day a full day. So therefore, one, two, three equals three days and three nights. Based on what? They never give a scripture reference. I've been looking for one for about eight years since I started studying this, at least really in depth. Haven't, I haven't found one. Maybe you know and I'm missing one. I did find one where Jesus said a day is called 12 hours. So I'll show you that until I find something different. Now, when do the days begin? Again, we're not guessing. We're not saying, well, I think it's the 13th, and I think it's the 14th, and we think it's the 15th. Did you know that this year, um, Passover, according to the secular Jewish calendar, the Orthodox calendar, lined up exactly with Easter today? So Passover would have been on the 14th. <clears throat> but all the Jewish people celebrated Passover on the 15th. Now, we just read that you're supposed to celebrate it on the 14th. They all celebrate it on the 15th. So I read another article and another article. Why are they do? Why are they, are they counting from the even the wrong way? How do they get to the 15th? And then they have two cedar meals on the 12th and the 13th, and then another thing on the 14th separate, then the Passover on the 15th. And then I found the answer. You know what the answer is? We don't have any sacrifices today. Therefore, there's nothing to do on Passover since Passover is a sacrifice. What a mess. So we're just going to throw it out. We're not even going to act like it's the 14th, and we're just going to begin our days of unleavened bread on the 15th without a Passover, without a sacrifice, and without anything following the Old Testament commandments. That's the state of the Jewish people today. Now, when do, this, when do these days begin? Look at Leviticus 23. Look in verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord. Even holy convocations. Convocation is when a bunch of people get together. It's an assembly of people called together. Which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. That makes the first day a Sabbath day. Verse 8, But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Everybody see that the 14th is a Passover. The 15th is a day of rest. It's a Sabbath. Look over at Leviticus 23:27. Now, in case anybody wondered how to start the day, um, first of all, does everybody see the problem? Does everybody see the problem on how do you start a day? How many of you are a little bit confused right now? Okay, good. Maybe I need to state the problem a little clearer. So I told you that the evening and the morning were the first day. Let's pick this day. When God created everything, he said, I want you to start your your days on the calendar at 6 p.m. in the evening, and that's the day. That's the 14th, okay? And then you go until the even at 6 p.m. You say, does anybody actually do this? Yes, as a matter of fact, the Jewish people will close up shop in Israel. If you go to Jerusalem today, at about 5.30, the whole place is just a ghost town. Everybody's packed up shop because it's uh, Friday, or Friday night, and everybody goes home. Everybody's ready to honor the Sabbath. And so they do nothing from 6 p.m. Friday night because that begins Saturday. Now, here's the confusion. 
When I say the 14th, and the Bible says, take a lamb and sacrifice it on the 14th, how do I know that it means the 14th here in the even and not the 14th here in the even? That's the problem, right? So he could have said the 13th at even or the 14th at even, and you could think it was either one, right? That's the confusion, okay? Because of that confusion, the Lord gave you the answer. Look in Leviticus 23, 27. This is another feast that happens on the 10th day of the seventh month. We're not going to get into this feast. Just look at 27, 10th day of the seventh month. Now look down at verse 32, and he clears everything up. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even. Ye shall celebrate your Sabbath. So do you want to find out when the tenth day is? Here's the tenth day. When do you celebrate the tenth day? You go to the ninth month, right here. You go to 6 p.m. in the evening. You start your day right here, and then it said from even to even. So from here to here, that equals the tenth. Does everybody see that? I know. First time I studied this out, I had this chart shifting left and right and upside down and inside out. The 14th day starts on the 13th day at even. And he told you that in Leviticus 23 on the Feast of Tabernacles. He gave you the clarity on it. Okay? Go back to Exodus 12 one more time. Exodus 12. Verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Shouldn't that say the whole assembly of Israel shall kill them in the evening? This is thousands of lambs for thousands of households. But it doesn't say them, it says it. Because it's one lamb. It's one lamb that's coming up in the future. And they don't even know what they're celebrating. They don't even know what they're representing here. And they're picturing the cross every time they turn around. Look at verse 7. They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. What happens when you take blood on a door post like that? I've done a little bit of framing here and there. Every door has a side post. And then it has two side posts in our framing. And then it has a header. And the header sits on a jack right here. And then it has a king stud. Whoops. Oh, yeah, they go all the way up. King stud like that that goes all the way up to the, to the ceiling. And they're told to take the blood and put some blood right here on the side post. They're told to take some blood and put it right here on this post. Dipping it in a bucket with hyssop, making a mess everywhere. Put some blood right here on the header, on the top of that door post. And when, what happens to that blood? The blood makes a big old mess right below where they put it. And they didn't know this. They had no idea what they were doing. Those priests didn't know that 2,000 years later, 1,500 years later, that the Son of God was going to come on a cross and he was going to have a crown of thorns placed on his head. And he's going to have some wounds there. He's going to have his hands and his feet pierced. And he's going to have wounds here and wounds here and all that blood is going to run down at his feet. And he's got wounds in his feet. And then the soldier comes in and takes a sword and puts it in his side or a spear, and out comes the water and the blood. And they're making the picture of the cross every, every way that you can look at this thing. It's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. It's the blood on the side post and the blood on the upper post, wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh, and that night roast with fire. Look at the elements here. Fire, unleavened bread, bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, verse 9, nor sodden with water. So you don't get to boil it, and you definitely don't eat it raw, but you roast it with fire, his head, with his legs, with the pertinence thereof. Pertinence is the appendages. That's the, the other things that are part of the animal. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. Now Jesus Christ went to that upper room with his disciples. And they said, when are we going to prepare the Passover? And Jesus said, we're going to prepare the Passover tonight. So they go rent that room, and they come here, and they have the Passover 
the evening of the 13th, right here. And they have a song about midnight and they leave. Remember that? You say, how could Jesus Christ be the Passover and be the Passover lamb and have the Passover the night before? Because they had the Passover here on the 14th and they had the Passover here, the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, while it's still the 14th on the cross. You say, but in the Old Testament, when they had that Passover lamb, they weren't supposed to leave any of it until morning. No, they weren't. But if they did, they were supposed to do something with it. What do they do if they leave it till the morning? Verse 10. He shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Was Jesus Christ the Passover lamb? Yes, he was. Was he left until the morning? Yes, he was. He had a three and a half year ministry. These days picture years. And then up to right here, it pictures the Passover day. And right here, Jesus Christ gets crucified on the cross, and he has no water given to him. Did you see that they ate it with bitter herbs and nor sodden it all with water? Just roast it with fire with no water, and bitter herbs shall they eat it. And Jesus Christ went through that bitterness of death. Before he even got to the cross, he shed great drops of blood. And he was out there in the middle of Gethsemane there with his disciples falling asleep, and him doing battle. Him sitting there in tears and agony with the angel coming and ministering to him. But he went through some bitterness there in Gethsemane. And then he sits, uh, gets hung up on the cross and he says, I thirst. I thirst. And what did they bring him? You would think that of all that Jesus Christ did for this world, that he could get what he asked for a couple times. He shows up in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well and says, give me a drink of that water. And they get to talking and chit-chatting and you've got five husbands and you're a prophet. And yes, I am. And if I saw the Son of God, I'd believe he's the one standing right in front of you right now. And Jesus never did get that drink of water. And then Jesus Christ goes to the cross and he says, I thirst. And somebody runs and gets a pitcher filled up with vinegar instead of water. And they said, this will help. This is what you need. This will numb the pain. And Jesus says, uh, that's not what I asked for. I asked for water, but he never got it. He couldn't get it because he's the Passover lamb. And then they says there's fire there, and you burn it with fire. Acts chapter 2 says, Jesus Christ, his soul was not left in hell, neither was his soul made an offering for sin. Jesus Christ took the sins to hell. How did he take them to hell? Well, he went down there and took the keys of death and hell, and he got through the bars and the gates of hell. And like Jonah came out of hell, Jesus came out of hell. <laughs> you got a prophet in the Old Testament that went to hell and came back and preached, and Jesus Christ did the same thing. Jesus Christ came out of that place of fire and he was the sacrifice for you and me and that's how he paid for the sins. Now go to the New Testament and go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Now we got all the timing, best I can tell, got all the timing caught up until the 14th. Matthew 27 verse 45. <clears throat> Matthew 27, 45. It says, Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Okay, now this is a question for you homeschoolers. Ready? If you start your day at sunrise, and sunrise is hour zero, what time of day is the sixth hour? <laughs> Homeschooler. Another homeschooler. Let's try again. If you start your day at 6 a.m. at sunrise, and that's zero hour, what time of day is it by the time you get six hours into your day? 12, 12 noon. Ding, ding, ding. Good job. All right. So in the Old Testament, they're, or well, kind of Old Testament here, they're counting from the beginning of the day. So they're 12 hours in a day, right? And now we're up to the sixth hour. Uh, you say, why does the Bible have to be so confusing? I know why it has to be confusing. Because the Lord wants you to study it. That's all there is to it. That's it. There's no easier answer. You're supposed to be a student of the Word of God. That's it. So let's go to the middle of the day here. This is best I can tell. It's about the center right there. And that is called the sixth hour. Okay, and that's the Jewish time here, sixth hour. 
and there was darkness all over the face of the land until the ninth hour. Anybody want to hazard a guess to what time that will be on our calendar? All right, so we got 12 noon to 3 p.m. Okay, <laughs> now we know we've got three hours <laughs> left in the day. All right, let's read what else happens here real quick, and we'll go to Mark. Look at Matthew first. Verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said that at about 3 p.m. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest of the people, verse 49, the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. And those are the people that didn't understand the language of Aramaic that he said that in. Verse 50, there's a paragraph mark, so some things happened in between. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Turn to Mark 15. In Matthew chapter 27, sometime after 3 p.m., Jesus gave up the ghost. At Mark 15. Mark 15 and verse 33. Mark 15, 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi. I suppose it's the same thing. Lama Sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they saw it, when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth for Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar. So we got all the same timing here. Put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Now you notice there's no paragraph mark at 37, but some other things happened in between there. Verse 38, there's no paragraph mark, but there's definitely a time gap because we're going to see that in Luke and John. So turn to Luke 23. Luke 23. And look at verse 39. Luke 23, 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Verse 40, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Two guys about to die, they're within hours of death, and they're yelling and having this conversation, and one of them says, Don't you have any common sense? You're about to die. We're both here in the same boat. Wouldn't it be good to get a last chance, you know, Hail Mary pass here at the end, and maybe uh, try to find out a solution in our midst of our problem this guy has an inscription on him that says this is the, Jesus the king of the Jews that's in verse 38 maybe he is the king of the Jews what other hope do we have We're having this conversation here dost not thou fear God verse 41 and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man hath done nothing amiss that's the testimony of a lost criminal sitting there on the cross this man hath done nothing amiss Quite a testimony. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. 45. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Verse 46, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, said thus, he gave up the ghost. Um, I could have read this in Mark, but look at verse 47 as well. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. It says the centurion saw what was done, and he told the thief today. So the day is still going on. And the centurion can still see what's going on. Turn to John. Turn to John chapter 19. This is all happening within the daylight, day hours. 
John chapter 19 and verse 28. Now, John doesn't give you the time frame here in verse 28. If you are a Bible student, I want you to put a cross-reference. We're not going to have time to look at this. But at John 19.14, you have a famous supposed contradiction in your Bible. I'll just mention it here, but we're not going to teach on it because I think most of you are barely holding on here. But John 19.14, it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. Now that won't match these other hours. And so the question is, the sixth hour from what? The sixth hour from what? And I believe the answer is chapter 1815. If you want to put a note in there and you can look it up later. That's a question mark. I'm not teaching that for sure. But I believe it's the sixth hour from when Jesus was led away in the middle of the night. That would place at the sixth hour from 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And now you're at 8 a.m. in the morning. Now if you didn't catch all that, don't worry about it. That's a supposed contradiction in the Bible. But it didn't say the sixth hour of the day. It said the sixth hour, referencing probably when John was with him and saw him taken and followed him to uh, Caiaphas and then Pilate and down the line. Okay, back to our text here. John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Okay, now we're back on track. There was set a vessel full of vinegar. He filled a sponge with the vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now that's the end of the Old Testament, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, 15, 16, and 17. That's a good place to make a note in your Bible. You say, I know this is true because Jesus said these words. Now hold on. Jesus said a lot of words to people in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament law. You say, well, Jesus' words have to be more important than the Apostle Paul, because Paul was a sinner and Jesus wasn't a sinner. Jesus' words were 100% accurate to who he was speaking to, just like Paul's doctrine was accurate to who he's speaking to. All right, And if you think you found a contradiction in the Bible, sometimes what's contradicted is your understanding of who is speaking and who's being spoken to. All right, so at, at this church, we don't spend three years going through the Gospels and just teaching on the Gospels and preaching from the Gospels and saying, um, oh, how about the Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father? He's my Father. Our Father is a national statement. It's national from the nation of Israel. Now we could say that in a group in the church, our Father, okay, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We haven't even gotten one sentence into this thing. Thy kingdom come, praying for the kingdom to come. Didn't he already tell you that uh, the kingdom is within you? Didn't he already tell you that uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you? And Paul told you how to find the kingdom of God. It's get Jesus Christ in your heart. What are you praying for the kingdom to come for? Which kingdom are you praying for to come? Okay, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. That's a good prayer all the time, any dispensation. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. How many of you have run out of bread because you couldn't afford it, couldn't get it, and didn't have access to it uh, any time in the last six months? Any time in the last six years. Give us this day our daily bread. You say, well, it's spiritual. Okay, okay, I'll give you that. I need spiritual bread. It's found right here. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What does that got to do with anything? Who are you indebted to? You say the power company, the gas company, and the water company. <laughs> yeah, but you pay that every month. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. That's a good prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The kingdom on earth? No. No. That kingdom's still coming up. And I want that kingdom to show up, but I already have the right kingdom. So the prayer can be spiritualized, but the prayer fits a whole lot better to somebody 
who is waiting for a king to come back on this earth and rule in a kingdom because it means his salvation. And if he doesn't have that king, he's in debt. He can't pay his bills because he took the mark of the beast and he isn't able to get along with the Antichrist system. And he needs some supernatural bread. And Micah 6 tells you where it comes from. It comes from the same place it did in Exodus. It comes out of the sky as manna from heaven. That's on Salapetra with the Jews in the Old Testament. You know all that. Okay, that's the Lord's Prayer. Jesus is speaking here in the Old Testament setting until John chapter 19 and verse 30. Verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, parentheses, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. He didn't want them hanging on the cross on a holiday, on a high day. <clears throat> what did we read in the Old Testament about the beginning of Passover and the days of unleavened bread? Which day is a day where you shall do no servile work. Exodus chapter 12, Leviticus 23. Which day? The first day, 15th, is a Sabbath. No servile work. It tells you it's the 15th, the day of the 15th. That means at 6 o'clock here, you'd better be wrapped up and in your house and quiet and not making a ruckus and not working, certainly. Not buying, not selling, not going into the city. Remember Nehemiah shut the doors and they, were, they got lodged outside of the city a couple times because they were trying to buy and sell on the Sabbath? He shut the doors in the evening. That's uh, Nehemiah 13. Every week you have a Sabbath right here on Saturday. You know what you have time for right here? Turn to Mark chapter 16. This is the answer to the whole problem. You could make it Thursday, except for this problem right here. Mark 16. In John chapter 19, 31, if you're interested in this study, that really is the key verse. For that Sabbath was a high day. That wasn't a regular Sabbath. That was a Sabbath because it's day one of unleavened bread. And that continues for seven days. And then day seven is also a Sabbath, but that won't end up on our chart. Okay, we're almost done here. Look at Mark 16. And look at verse... Mm -hmm. uh, go back to 15, back up a little bit, 15. Verse 42, Mark 15, 42. Now when the even was come, so what time is it, give or take? 6 p.m. And what day are we at here? This is the same day as the crucifixion. So when even was come, and look at this phrasing. Because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So even is here, and they're saying today is the day before the Sabbath. And they're sitting right at even. It's getting dark. It's getting hard to see. Verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Uh, verse 44, and Pilate marveled if he were dead, if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of, a, of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. So Pilate knew he was dead. Joseph Arimathea knew it was dead. A Roman centurion knew he was dead. Jesus didn't swoon and get into the cross and then three days later flex his muscles and come out of there on his own um, physical strength. He was dead. And there's lots of skeptics that have lots of theories that don't match the scripture because they don't accept what the Lord said any time that the Lord speaks anyways. Verse 45, when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph, and he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher, which was hewn out of rock, and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. 
So they're not doing any work here. They're sitting off to the side watching this preparation happen. And they have their own spices, and they're preparing the body of Jesus and Mary, and Mary are sitting there watching. Mark 16, 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, or Salome, Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Question. When did they buy those spices? Hmm? Before the Sabbath. Which Sabbath? So if we could imagine that the three days and three nights is back up here with Thursday or Friday, and you have no day off right here, or no working day here, there's no time for them to go buy spices. And it says they showed up here and they had bought spices, but they hadn't bought them yet. So turn to Luke. Turn to Luke. Verse 52. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. If you wondered what craved meant, there's your definition in the Bible. It means to beg or to ask. Verse 53. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone where never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. There's Sabbath number one. Everybody got that? This is coming into Thursday, the high day. Verse 55, and the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after. Remember they said they weren't doing anything, they were just watching they followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. So they stand on the side and they watch everything. Verse 56, and they returned. Remember, this is a Sabbath, so they can't travel more than a Sabbath day's journey. They certainly can't buy or sell anything because it's the Sabbath. They returned, and then look at this. They prepared spices and ointments. Mark told you they bought them. Here it tells you they prepared what they bought. When did they do that? They got all day Friday to do that. All day. Unless you have a crucifixion on Thursday or Friday. And then they have no time to buy or prepare spices without breaking the Sabbath. But they didn't break the Sabbath. Read the verse, 56. They returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath according to what? The commandment. Which Sabbath is that? That's that one. There it is. Okay, I'm excited about it. You guys look like, okay, is that it? That's all I got. Mark 16, we'll be done. Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 9. Well, well, yeah, we can't just start in verse 9. Verse 2, I'll read fast. You think fast, I'll read fast. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher, look at this, at the rising of the sun. Okay, you're going to have to study this on your own. Again, make a cross reference to John 20 and verse 1. John 20 verse 1 is a supposed contradiction because John 20 verse 1 says they came when it was yet dark. Okay, so did they, did they come when it was dark or did they get there at the rising of the sun? so simple yeah, exactly. it's so simple they weren't like teleporting instantly <laughs> they had to travel while it was dark they traveled while it was dark they got there at the rising of the sun okay there's these contradictions that guys come up with these get repeated year after year after year in the theological seminaries the ones that teach the bible cause you to lose your faith in the bible year after year after year and they'll stand at the judgment on their own two feet and i'll just try not to be close. Okay, verse 2. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Now that verse actually had everything in it because very early in the morning, the first day of the week, that takes you all the way back to very early. That could be the night before. That could literally be as early as midnight or even the night before. 
Look in, uh, mm, I just saw something else. That's midnight. Hold on. Verse 3, And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Well, they said that on the way there, because when they got there, verse 4, they looked and they saw that the stone was rolled away. It's already rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. Stinking angels just love scaring people. Verse 6, And he said unto them, Be not affrightened. It's your own fault. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. You're going to see him later on in Galilee. Verse 8. They went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Those angels really work you over. All right. Verse 9. There's the verse I wanted. Now when Jesus was risen early, what does it say early? It said in verse 2, early in the morning the first day of the week. What does it say in verse 9? When Jesus was risen early the first day of the week. Now what's the earliest you can get in the first day of the week? Nope. The earliest you can get on the first day, because the day starts right here, is right there. You can't get any earlier than that. Now, you can only get early in the morning, I think, to uh, noon, or you could argue 3 a.m. because that's the morning watch or something like There's watches in these nights, and this is going to tie into next Sunday, maybe, if you guys want more. There's more. This is just part of it. Okay, so Mark 16, verse 9, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Okay, so when he had risen early, Comma, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. That's later in the morning. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. Now, did we already count this? Three days and three nights? Three days and three nights fits all this. Okay? One more problem. Very easy problem. Right here, Jesus told the thief on the cross, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, he was in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, and he had to take your sins to hell. Was Jesus three days and three nights in hell in the heart of the earth? No, he was not. Because he told the thief, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. When he told the thief today, he was with him today in paradise. That means he suffered for your sins in hell before all that. He suffered for those sins in hell. This is my explanation. Maybe you have a better one. If he was in hell for one second, he experienced eternity, which is outside of time, because hell is an eternal place. Now, I can't really put that on a timeline because we're talking about eternity that doesn't fit in time. But he told the thief today, so he took care of the sins in hell, however long that took. He suffered the eternal pain for an unnumerable amount of sins in hell, paid for them, told the devil to get out of the way, and he said, uh, <laughs> I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against himself, it. And they didn't prevail against him. He walked right through the gates of hell and came out to the other side in the heart of the earth. You say, you really believe all that mythological stuff that there's different places in the earth and there's different people ruling in different places? I think mythology is a, a corrupted imitation teaching of what the Bible tells you goes on in the heart of the earth. The Bible tells you there's Abraham's bosom in the heart of the earth. It tells you there's paradise in the heart of the earth. It tells you that there's hell in the heart of the earth. There's no question there's things going on in the heart of the earth. And scientists, you want science again? It's my theme of the day. They've drilled down seven miles into an earth that's 8,000 miles across, 4,000 to the middle. They've got seven miles in, and you're going to trust what they think is in the heart of the earth? They don't have any idea. <laughs> All right, Jesus was in the heart of the earth. And he preached to the captives after the war, and he led captivity captive, and they had a rip-roaring, I mean, holler and hooting time down there for three days. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise, and then Jesus is in the heart of the earth three days and three nights until here, and then he resurrects. And then many of the saints which slept arose and went into the city. And I don't know what they did for those few hours at night but they came into the city there was an earthquake the veil of the temple was rent in twain and all those things fit the middle of the night saturday night from sunday morning until sunday morning that was quite a night to behold i wish i could see that when i get to heaven okay uh does anybody have any questions on that anything 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 
I'm not sure if you guys understand me or not because you're looking at me so um, thoughtfully. Everybody got it? No questions at all? Yes. Yeah, let's use a different color and I'll count it. First 12 hours is a night. Yeah. So, can you see the dotted lines for the evenings? Let's do, um, let's pick some colors that make sense. And let's do these two colors. Can you see this color? Everybody see that all right? Okay, well, so that's days. So here's a day. And then this darker one is a night right here. Starts with a night. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a night. There's a night. So that's one, two, three. And then here's a day. Here's a day. And here's a day. That means he resurrected. <laughs> that means he resurrected here the end of the third day. It gives you three full days and three full nights. And it makes all the scriptures add up. There's a couple difficult scriptures where the, the guys on the road to Emmaus, I gave you all these at the beginning, they say, uh, today is the third day since all these things were done. And people are like, they can't be standing here because they'd have to say the fourth day or the fifth day. And I looked up since in a dictionary, and since means from a specified time until now. Well, they're counting from here, here, and here, and not counting this full day, and it still fits. Mm -hmm. I just, if I would've looked up since in a dictionary eight years ago, that wouldn't have bothered me for so long. But that's, that's the only problem I've found with this, is the people that say, is it at three days or after three days? And if you don't count this as a day, then everything fits. And so what is secular? Bible teaching do they count this as a day and you don't have one like f thread of scripture to support that and then you kind of get it stuck in your mind you're trying to make that work all all the way through this and it won't work when you study the Bible you have to throw out everything you were taught <laughs> and you have to throw out everything you assume and you have to say Lord I know that I say that I believe this book but please help me to actually believe this book uh, I, I just I've done it probably 15 times trying to figure out something and is Omri Ahab's grandmother or daughter or whatever it is and you're like oh it has to be granddaughter because everybody says it's granddaughter it's not and you'll spin your wheels for three days trying to f make the chronology work and the Bible had it right without it being a granddaughter it says daughter that kind of thing so I know that's a little bit of a mess there but <laughs> um, if I could get one thing across to you out of this lesson that you trust the words of this book that's it. That's, that's really it. You say, oh, I believe it. You believe it until I tell you something that it says that you don't like. That's where the point of contention. And if you never come to that point of contention, then yeah, we'll get along fine. And you'll get along fine. But it's the point where the Lord says, hey, this is wrong, and here's why it's wrong. You say, somebody else is doing it. I know, but the verse says it's wrong. You say, well, the pastor doesn't think it's wrong, but the verse says it's wrong. You say, my friends at another church do this. Yeah, but the verse says it's wrong, and I'm convicting you about it in your daily Bible reading, and I shed light on it, and I've shown you the truth of the thing. Will you accept it from me, your Savior, that this is wrong? Well, everybody sins. <laughs> You're like, okay, and then God moves on. Then he'll move on, and he will not take you one step further until you circle right back around to that thing right there and deal with it. Amen and oh me. Amen. Okay. All right, Lord. There's a lot of things in there. I ask that some of it was a help. At least uh, we've all seen it once, and maybe the things will fall into place later if we have time to study them. Lord, I ask that you please help us to trust your book. Lord, I ask that you please help us to trust you and your leading, and we know that you won't lead us astray from anything we find in there, in your words. Lord, I ask that you help us to have a little bit of faith today and a little bit more tomorrow. Lord, I ask that you please bless the attempts that we're doing and our humility and trying to have a contrite heart lord and trying to be submissive to what you'd have us to do lord help us to be yielded to you help us to abide in you and bless this week now in jesus name amen 
Okay.